from the BBC World Service in association with ABC and All India Radio. This is Stumped. Hello and welcome to Stumped, your intercontinental hit of news features and debate from the quirky world of cricket. I'm Alison Mitchell and I have made it to Melbourne. No quarantine for international arrivals now, although you still have to be an Australian citizen or have an exemption to get in. So very grateful for my Australian heritage at the moment, although not that impressed with the Melbourne weather, as you can tell I'm wearing a rather thick jumper but I'm told it's going to improve but it is great to be back down under again. I'm Jeff Lemon coming from the city of dreams Brisbane Australia where you do still have to do quarantine to get in and hopefully it won't rain off the test match because it's been raining for days. We always learn something new every day city of dreams Brisbane never knew that now I do hello everybody this is Charu Sharma on behalf of All India Radio I'm back home in Bangalore still nursing a torn right shoulder which means very little play it means a lot more watching though and the way that test match between India and New Zealand started out in Kanpur, it looks like it's going to be a fascinating series. Should be. Jeff, welcome along. Good to have you with us this week in particular. And I'm looking forward to your insights on our first item because well, when we spoke on last week's show, the English game was in turmoil and it, the Yorkshire racism crisis was, was at its height. But since then, it's become the turn of Australia, who are going through a crisis of a slightly different nature. And they are currently without their test captain. Tim Payne, who's married with two children, chose to step down last week when it emerged he'd sent explicit text messages, including an explicit photo, to a female employee of Cricket Tasmania in 2017. His tearful resignation speech came more than three years after he became captain when he replaced Steve Smith, who had also given a memorable and emotional press conference when vacating the role of Australia's sandpaper ball tampering scandal. Now, Cricket Australia received a complaint about the text messages back in 2018, and they did investigate it at the time. Payne was cleared of any misconduct, and the matter wasn't made public. He was appointed captain later that year. Billed as the clean-cut man who would lead Australia out of its pool tampering crisis in a new era of elite honesty. Now, Jeff, you were reporting at the centre of that pool tampering scandal in Cape Town, and were very close to the team as they then started their a uh, new era under Tim Payne as well. I mean, a lot has been said and written about all of this and the circumstances over the last week. First of all, was Tim Payne right to stand down as captain? I don't think he had a choice, really. He had to stand down in the circumstances. And there's been some revisionism. It's, it's been interesting how quickly this has evolved from when he stood down to a few days later with various uh, people, former administrators and so on, coming out and saying he should have been backed, he should have been allowed to stay there on the basis that this was a, a personal uh, breach, you know, something to do with his private life and, and therefore wasn't related to being a test captain. But it's not really the case when it involves something in a workplace um, and when it involves someone who was not a high-ranking person at Cricket Tasmania, there was a professional imbalance there. So it's a convenient misinterpretation really to say that this was all a personal matter and should have been allowed to stay as such. There was still workplace inappropriateness um, no matter how which way you decide to cut it. What about the way Cricket Australia have handled it? I suppose back then but let's focus on the, the current administration and in particular the media conference that was given by the chair and chief executive. I think what really jars is the way that in 2018 Cricket Australia were all about we're going to turn over a new leaf, we're going to fix our image, we're going to fix our cultural problems and they still installed somebody who they knew at that point had a skeleton in the closet. Uh, they knew that there was a, a scandal which would hurt the team and Tim Payne personally if it came out and they still put him in. As you said off the top, the era of elite honesty, they were still willing to bury a scandal which could come out at any moment. You know, there was no guarantee that this wasn't going to come out. So at the very least, it was extremely foolish. And it was also incredibly hypocritical to try to be burying stories when you're supposed to be uh, having a full cultural revamp and, and, and making the institution anew. Charu, is there, you know, for a case for, for burying stories, I mean, would it have been better to sort of rip the plaster off at the time if you're appointing a captain and as an organisation, you know that there is this investigation, albeit, you know, by Cricket Australia at the time, they had cleared him. So it could have been a short but painful episode, but to be up front with it at the start and say, yes, he's our new captain. Yes, this has happened, but he's been cleared and we absolutely back him going forwards. And it could have saved a lot of longer term pain. 
Well, I do think Jeff has made some wonderful points, and I, you know, uh, apologies for the repetition if I if I indulge in a bit. But these days, you know, the digital world is very difficult to keep things hidden. So yes, there's no doubt about it. Particularly the circumstance about Australia and Sand Papergate. You're appointing a new captain, particularly because of his character and personality, to take Australian cricket forward in a clean manner, knowing that there's a skeleton. That was just so short-term thinking. Just so you know, like a <laughs> may, I, may I quote that term again from uh, from uh, Steve? A brain fade. It should have been handled right there and then, and a new captain could have been appointed. So this is very, uh, I don't think CAE reacted very well at all, but I've got to compliment um, uh, the captain, Payne, for actually resigning very quickly. So more on that later, but I think that high moral ground is very important, and to do it quickly was equally important before public reaction caught up and said, well, why aren't you taking some action here? I suppose a difficulty, maybe morally, ethically, with these kind of matters is it doesn't just involve the player who is being investigated, there would have been ramifications for Tim Payne's family as they are living through now in, in the public eye. The degree to which those kind of things ought to be taken into account, perhaps were taken into account at the time, we will never entirely know about that. Jeff, I mean, lessons that could be actually learnt from this, do you think, going forwards? Putting all the focus on the future means not actually dealing with the present. Uh, this isn't something that you can say, oh, we need to have learned from, because if CA couldn't learn in 2018 that hiding things was not a, a viable solution when you're that sort of organisation, then how are they going to magically learn it now? I mean, their investigation into the sandpaper uh, saga was a whitewash, really. They didn't investigate past the one test match. Uh, their investigation into this issue was a whitewash. They didn't um, get the cooperation of, of the other person involved. So every time we get an investigation out of CA, it's really a public relations exercise more than a, a genuine investigation with integrity. New captain, then Jeff, there are a number of candidates. Uh, a panel has been set up, hasn't it, to, to select the new test captain. So they've got a bit of a choice to make. Well, I'm sure they did uh, a fair bit of due diligence just to find out if, if there were any other skeletons about to lurch out of any closets. But my understanding <laughs> of it is that the, the panel only interviewed one person for the job, and that was Patrick Cummins. So I think we can pretty safely infer that uh, he will get it. Uh, the other interesting part, though, is that the panel interviewed Steve Smith for the vice captaincy. So that means that if and when Cummins misses a test match, which presumably he will at some point, Steve Smith will captain Australia again, but not in a permanent capacity. So I wonder if that's a, a deliberate move by CA to sort of to give Steve Smith that little bit of extra redemption polish to say he got to come back to be a captain, but without having to take the flack from appointing him full time. I'm smiling because I, I have uh, for many months now said Pat Cummins may not be the best option because... Well, the, the the fast bowling load is torturous. And, and for somebody to go, not to be at fine leg and third man and recovering, but to constantly think about every ball of every match, it's a, it's a little tough. And, and he may be the best man in terms of, I don't know, his behavior and character and, and experience, but why burden Pat Cummins? I know he's a fabulous cricketer, much a better bowler, I suppose. He can bat a bit too. But don't give him that additional responsibility because so many fabulous cricketers have wilted under that responsibility and you really want Pat Cummins to go the same way. A, a couple of things on that. I, I don't really agree that it is a problem for fast bowlers to be captains. They, they have done the job before. There, there have been standout examples. It is difficult because you have a more physical workload in the field and you, and you have to keep your brain going. But that's where you have support from other senior players. Um, you have other players looking out for things and uh, feeding information into you. And the thing about Cummins is he, he rarely is at fine leg. He rarely is in the deep. He's usually fielding at mid-on or mid-wicket. He's, he's an agile, close to the wicket player. So he's often um, up relatively closer to the bat anyway. There's no reason why he can't be giving directions to fellow bowlers from mid-on. And I, I think you've got to give a player the opportunity rather than ruling him out before he's ever had a go at it and saying it would be too difficult. Give him the chance to see if he can manage it. If he can't, you'll find out. But, I mean, to be honest, Australia play about two test matches a year these days, so you can't imagine <laughs> the workload would be very high. <laughs> Even if you're away from home. <laughs> now, shortly on Stumped, we're going to hear from Perth Scorchers all round at Marazan Cap on playing in the WBBL final. But we also spoke to her about her fellow compatriot, A.B. de Villiers, 
The former South Africa captain announced his retirement from professional cricket last week. He'd already retired from internationals, of course, in 2018, where he clocked up 114 tests, 228 one-day internationals and 78 international T20s. And he averaged more than 50 in both test and ODI cricket and scored nearly 9,500 runs in his international T20 career to boot. And Jeff, I don't know whether you've ever heard Charu speak about AB de Villiers on Stumped <laughs> before, but <laughs> Charu, I have to say, yours was one of the first tweets that I saw after that announcement came out. A true hero, you wrote ambassador, role model, inspiration. I'm not going to go on. Over to you. <laughs> Gosh, yeah, well, I don't tweet much, that's for sure, but I was sort of inspired to. And you really want to let me loose? Let me just sort of, you know, get my <laughs> sleeves ready for this one. Uh, of course, he's a biggish hero in India, uh, not just around the world, because of his uh, franchise cricket. And there was this test match, what was it, some three, four, five years ago in Mumbai, which is the home of Indian cricket in many ways. And the Indian team walked in there and they were kind of, you know, there was this big loud roar and what have you. And yet, when A.B. de Villiers walked in for South Africa to bat, the whole stadium went up A.B.D., A.B.D. <laughs> and the Indian cricketers were looking around saying, well, hang on, aren't you supposed to be supporting us? So it was a wonderful moment and an acknowledgement of just his incredible global respect in the game and, and as a person as well. So, I mean, you really have to watch it. You know, I'll go on and on, but you know, I'll leave it to you, Alison, <laughs> because an exemplary career. How about that? I feel like somebody like him, he has made, he's transformed batting, but he also made bowlers better. You think as he invented shots, bowlers had to invent deliveries to try and combat players like him in the T20 era. So the, the slower ball bounces, the, the knuckle balls, different bowling variations. So I feel like he's he had such an impact on batting in the game. But I think conversely, he also has had quite an impact on the way bowling has developed as well. Because how do you stop someone like A.B. de Villiers? But yeah, an absolute legend of the game and will be remembered as a, as a game-changing batter and a fine human being. Now, this Saturday is the final of the Women's Big Bash League and it will take place in Perth after the Perth Scorchers topped the group stage, meaning that they progressed straight to, through to the final with hosting rights as well. Now, the Scorchers have never won the Women's Big Bash, but one member of their side is no stranger to winning a franchise competition. South Africa all-rounder Marazan Kapp has won the WBBL twice before and earlier this year she won the inaugural 100 competition in England with the Oval Invincibles as well. I caught up with her and asked her what experience she can bring to her teammates now to help with her Scorchers in the final. Well, Marazan, it's great to have you on Stumped. Now, Perth Scorchers have never won the WBBL, but you have got experience of winning it twice with the Sydney Sixers. So what advice and experience can you bring forward to the Scorchers? Look, to be honest, I've, I've said it in a few interviews. I don't know how they've never been able to, to win a, a, a women's big bash because I've always felt like they were one of the, the better teams in the competition. Um, but yeah, look, I think overall, this is probably one of the better teams I've, I've seen um, that the butch, that the Scorchers have, have put forward. Um, so I think this year might be our year. And, and hopefully with me being luck, lucky enough to, uh, to have played in the recent 100 and winning there, like hopefully I can, can bring some good performances um, to this weekend's final. And the WBBL was a, a leader in terms of equal prize money for men's and women's, the BBL and the WBBL, the 100 the same. How significant are moves like that, do you feel, in, in that sense of gender equity? Or are there more visible things maybe which, which have more of an impact? No, it was so nice. Like what I've told everyone when I um, left um, the 100 and got you to the big bash, like we stayed in the same hotels as the men, um, play the same grounds and I think with us over here um, playing on the big grounds as well now and um, being treated similarly to the men it's it, it just makes you as a person and as a, a woman's um, cricketer and for women's sport in general it just makes you feel so much better it, it, it shouldn't really but it, 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 it really does because now you you start believing that people actually care about the sport and they care about women's sport and about treating women equally as well. What aspects are there still to work on? Do you feel that generally 
the main areas of, of equity are being addressed and are heading in the right direction now? It's definitely, we, sh- we are moving. Up. <laughs> when I first started where we were to, to where it is now, it's actually unbelievable to think um, that all of this happened while I was still playing. I always thought that I was just going to miss all of this. Um, and I'm so jealous when people tell me they're 25 years old or 20 years old because I'm like, can I just start over again? <laughs> playing now because there's it's it's a proper career now for for any young kid playing sport um and yeah like I said I, I just think it's it's so important for for women's sport in general um but I would still like to see an improvement not only from the big countries but from the the smaller countries as well so that every single team is given the the right support and equipment to to compete with your better teams because I've, I've always felt like yes you've got your big teams but it's not necessarily been because they are so much better than the smaller countries it's just those smaller countries don't have the resources that your bigger nations have so I, I just I would like to see everyone across the board being treated the same way. What about the idea of Ramiz Raja, the Pakistan Cricket Board chairman, has been speaking quite positively about a Pakistan Super League for women. Um, an Indian, an IPL for women has been in the pipeline, have been talked about for, for so long without much action. But do you think something like the, a Pakistan Super League could really take the game in that particular country forward by leap? Pakistan is one of those teams, I feel like they're a bit up and down, they can be brilliant, but then sometimes they struggle as well. And something like bringing one of those league um so that some of your youngsters and can can get the same experience of of playing against international players like like the domestic players in the Big Bash and over in England has done. I think it will definitely um, help those countries, and I'll definitely be excited to to be a part of that as well. Hopefully, Marazan, best of luck for the final with Perth Scorchers, and thanks so much for coming on Stump. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, that is all we've got time for on Stump this week on All India Radio. Don't forget you can follow us throughout the week on Twitter. We're at BBC WS Sport and use the hashtag BBC Stumped. Check us out on YouTube too. Go to BBC World Service YouTube. For now, I'll say thank you to Cherry Sharma and Jeff Lemon. And of course, to you for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye bye. From the BBC World Service in association with ABC and All India Radio, this is Stumped.